Welcome to the Way Church Service at Greystone with Pastor John. We invite you to join us at 1 Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by The Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. You know how we're going to start this, right? Let's see, in the front row first. Looks high. Smiles over there. Come on. Right? Heaven is our home. We're saved by His grace and His grace alone. Amen? We all got up this morning, right? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Welcome to the Way Service at Greystone. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this morning to get a portion of God's Word. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus, this morning. <laughs> for making all this possible for us by going to the cross, shedding His blood for the forgiveness of our sins, and becoming the final sacrifice for our sins so we can have a new life, eternal life, spiritual life, and a new purpose here on planet Earth for all who believe in the one and only Son of God. We gather here to learn about our Creator, and find our purpose here and use it to glorify God and to serve our Lord and Savior and one another. Our goal, this ministry has a goal, and that is to grow spiritually and start to handle life God's way, not our way. God's Word, which is the Bible, becomes the owner's manual to our lives, and we study it, learn it, read it, and apply it to see how God wants us to live, how to think, how to act, how to serve, And how to treat ourselves and others. Thank you, Jesus. Each part of his body is very precious to God. One body, many parts. I want to personally welcome all of you to the way this morning. We depend on God's grace, not our own power to accomplish his will for our lives. I also want to say a shout out to the people on our live feed. If they are watching with us and they consider this their church, if they would support it and donate to it so we can keep the message going beyond the four walls and into the lost and dying world. And if you have a cell phone, can you please silence it so it doesn't disturb this morning's service? And we will start this with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus, thank you for giving us this beautiful day to gather together to worship you, to honor you, and to glorify you, Lord, and to place your name above all names, even our own, as all of us fight to put you first in our lives, Lord. Thank you for your matchless grace and tender-hearted mercies that begin afresh every day, Lord. Thank you for our health, Lord. Thank you for our vision. Thank you for all the provisions that you provide for us each and every day, Lord. Let us never lose sight of that, Lord. Let us see you in everything, Lord. We pray, Lord, for our great nation, Lord, that you make it great again by getting back in the White House, Lord, getting into the Spirit, Lord, back into the White House, Father, so we could bring the country back to its former glory. We pray for the people who aren't feeling well and are getting healed. Our sister Susan, our brother George, Alana, our very young girl. We also have uh, another request for... uh, Russell and the mother Rosemary from Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, that wants to be in our prayers and part of our ministry. So please keep them in your prayers. And also anyone else who needs a prayer, as all of us do, right? This world is going crazy out there, Lord. Please lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us, Lord, from the evil one every day, Father. And as always, let all this be led by your spirit this morning, Lord, and not my flesh. And it's in Jesus' powerful name that I pray. Amen and amen. All right, we're going to stand and we are going to worship the Lord. Mm-hmm. 
Amen. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. I'd like to thank the people that came in yesterday and continue to come in on Saturday to make the church look great. That fellowship hall is looking brand new again. Coming back, the church is coming back to life. Uh, like I was saying, another thing, we're going to be um, fixing the air conditioner so we can get it even stronger. My brother Skip's going to help us out there. So we're grateful for that. One body. Uh, have a round of applause for the church this morning. Everybody's got gifts, talents, and abilities to use it to glorify God and to keep us all comfortable and growing in the Lord. Amen? When you choose to serve Him, He always blesses us. All right, we're going to start this morning in Lamentations chapter 3. As always, the Holy Spirit will be taken over as I go into these scriptures. So prepare your mind and clear your heart to receive the message the Spirit is trying to say to the church this morning. Amen? And please continue to support the church and the building fund so we could definitely get it back to our former glory as a lot of work still needs to be done. Keep that in mind. All right, she's got us in verse 21, but we definitely have to back up. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to go to verse 19. The prophet Jeremiah is lamenting over his nation as it got conquered, and he's trying to explain to us that he was into a deep depression. And as we have to understand it, all of us go into depression. It's part of life, and the God is the Holy Spirit will help us in our times of trouble if we trust in Him. Look at verse 19. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. The prophet was lamenting. He, the, the nation Israel was conquered. They chose to serve other gods. God chastened them for it. 
And in verse 21 he says, Yet I still did hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness and his mercies begin afresh each morning. How about a big amen there for the Lord? So whatever you're going through, the Bible clearly tells us it's only for a season. If we trust in the Lord, he's going to get us through and the bird with the broken wing can fly even higher when he gets through it. Amen? So all of us go through these times of trials and testings. Look at verse 24. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. Verse 26, so it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. So what does it mean, wait quietly? While you're going through something, keep praying, keep hoping, keep serving, don't murmur, don't complain. Just wait on the Lord quietly. He will get us through, for salvation comes from the Lord. And it is good for people to submit at an early age, verse 27, to the yoke of his discipline. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. Let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them and accept the insults of their enemies. For no one is abandoned by the Lord forever. How about a big amen there? Though he brings grief, he also shows compassion because of the greatness of his unfailing love. For he does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. How about a big amen there? If people are crushed underfoot, all the prisoners of the land, if they deprive others of their rights in defiance of the Most High, if they twist justice in the courts, doesn't the Lord see all these things? Who can command things to happen without the Lord's permission? The Bible tells us nothing. I mean, nothing can happen in anyone's life unless it goes through the permission hand of God. And it says, Does not the Lord Most High send both calamity and good? Then why should we mere humans complain when we are punished for our sins? Instead, let us test and examine our ways, and let us turn back to the Lord. How about a big amen there? So what's he saying? Just look in the mirror, evaluate your life, Examine your way. Say, Lord, you know what? I'm not all that I ought to be, but I definitely ain't what I used to be, Lord. So please, Lord, have mercy on me. Your grace begins afresh every day. I'm going to wait on you, and everything's going to be okay. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Let us not complain, because the Lord has us, and he has our back. Jesus always has, and he always will, if we trust in him. How about a big amen there? All right, so we're going to be talking about God's grace again. The power of it. And some of the things you might not have known about God's grace. And how powerful it really is. As I studied this grace piece, it is so powerful in the believer's life. And if we understand it and use it in its proper context, we can overcome any obstacle that the devil, that the world, that anybody could ever put in our path. Amen? If we understand it and if we use it in its proper form. Okay? So have you ever thought about what grace really means? Perhaps like my friends, you recognize God's mercy, but what do you truly understand about God's grace? Number one, let's explore some essential facets about his grace that we might need to know, that we might not know. Number one, grace gives you what you don't deserve. Number one, okay? We have to understand that in its essence. Okay, grace is the unmerited favor of God. It gives us what we don't deserve and that what we cannot earn. You cannot earn his favor. You cannot earn his grace. The Greek word for grace is also translated as divine favor. 
okay? It is God's power at work in each of our lives, empowering us to become who he has called us to be. Joint is with Christ, new creations, righteous in his sight, and children of God. So you see, it's God's grace that empowers you to fulfill your purpose in the good work that God has set before you to do. Think of it as the fuel that ignites your spiritual fire and enables you to live out your calling. Grace is not just a one-time gift. Okay? It is an ongoing process in our lives as we walk with God. Have you ever noticed times in your life where you overcame difficult circumstances or temptations or were able to extend love and forgiveness to others when you didn't really feel like doing that? That's the grace of God flowing through you. As you walk humbly before God, you begin to understand that everything you have and everything you are is a result of His amazing grace working within you. How about a big amen there? Number two, the reign of grace breaks sin's tyranny. The Apostle Paul gives assurance in Romans 6.14, go there. Romans 6.14, that sin is no longer has dominion over you because you are no longer under the law, but under grace. Falling from grace doesn't happen when you sin, It's when you try to combat sin in your own strength, relying on legalism and self-effort. True victory, though, over sin comes through a revelation of God's grace, understanding that we are forgiven and accepted despite of our shortcomings. Oh, thank you, Lord. Just think about that. We're accepted in the beloved despite of our shortcomings and our failures. Grace breaks the chains of guilt, freeing us from the oppression of sin, and allowing us to live victoriously in Christ. How about a big amen there? Is everybody in Romans 6.14? All right. Everybody with me so far here? Christians have to understand how powerful you are with Jesus inside of you. Look at verse 14 of Romans 6. Romans 6, 14 says clearly, Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. God's grace sets us free from the power of sin, giving us the ability to make the right choices when sin comes calling. And we could actually say no to it. Does grace give you, let me me just, this is a lot of people don't don't understand grace. That's why I'm going to teach this. Does grace give you a license to indulge in sin? A lot of people think it does. Absolutely not. Grace empowers you to live a life of holiness and righteousness out of gratitude for God's unconditional love. God has provided a way for you to be an overcomer through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, and it's all through His marvelous, amazing grace. That ought to put a smile on your face. You'll begin to walk in greater freedom, totally free from the bondage of sin and shame. The devil wants us, when we fail, to walk in guilt in condemnation and shame, hanging our heads low as Christians, when we should hang our heads high knowing that Jesus paid that price for us and sin is no longer our master and it no longer controls us because we live under the freedom of God's grace. How about a big amen there? Sin makes us miserable. Sin makes us depressed. Sin makes us uncomfortable. One thing about sin, it does nothing good for us. In the beginning, it might satisfy something, but at the end, it leads in spiritual death. Can I get an amen here? The third principle, grace is personified by Jesus Christ. Listen to me now. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15, go there, that he became an apostle of grace. 
after his encounter with Jesus on the road of Damascus. <laughs> First Corinthians 15. Paul knows everything that he was because of God's grace. Paul wasn't taught grace. Paul, he met grace. Okay? He wasn't taught grace. He met grace. Jesus. He got a revelation of grace and he got knocked off his donkey. If you want to understand grace, you don't just need doctrine. You need Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, Paul says this clearly. <clears throat> but whatever I am now, and you can say this about yourself, whatever you are now, it is because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. Whatever you are today, after becoming a believer in Jesus Christ, and whatever you accomplished is through the power of His grace, and His grace alone. How about a big amen there? I don't know, that excites me. Let me tell you something, because I couldn't, I couldn't do anything in God's will of my own. Believe me, everything I did was for myself, not for Jesus. Something happened there. Transformation happened. I no longer want to live for myself. I want to live for Him, because, listen... Everything in this planet is going to go. You can't take anything with you, right? Only what's done for Jesus Christ will last. Whatever you do for yourself gets burned up and it doesn't come with you. So it produces nothing. So therefore, be strong. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know, I say it all the time. One life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Jesus Christ will last. So don't waste your time trying to make gains down here because you can't take it with you anyway. So go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Jesus' life on earth exemplified grace in action. He had compassion for the outcasts, the sinners, and the brokenhearted. The ultimate expression of His grace was displayed on the cross where he took upon himself the punishment you and I deserved, think about this, and offered us forgiveness and reconciliation to God. When you encounter Jesus, his grace will overwhelm you, overwhelm you, and transform your life from the inside out. How do you get a deeper understanding of grace? To a personal relationship with Jesus. When you surrender your life to the Lord, you allow Him to shape you and lead you at each step of your journey. When you spend time in His presence and in His Word, you are renewing your mind to the truth. As you walk with Jesus, you learn to extend grace to the world around us, just as Jesus extended it to you. How about a big amen there? Just imagine all the grace that God gives us every day. We get up, sometimes we're cranky and miserable. Sometimes we murmur and complain. And His grace is right there to what? Cover that. And you go on your way and God's grace covers it. Now, can you extend that on others? When somebody else is going through something and murmuring and complaining and having a bad day, or do you attack them? Or do you what? Belittle them and say, you shouldn't be like that. You should read the Bible. No, we're not Pharisees here. We're what? We, we walk like Christ-likeness where we give grace and mercy to people because God gives us grace and mercy every single day. We don't judge and we don't condemn. We what? We love, we encourage, and we comfort, and we get out of the way and let Jesus work through us. That's what the Christian life is all about. It's about you getting out of the way and letting Jesus work inside you to show the lost and dying world that there's another force out there greater than the powers of hell. If you allow it. All right, so everybody, in, look, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. A good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. Timothy, my dear son. He's telling him. Look what he's telling him. Be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. The only way we can be strong in the Christian life is through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen here? It's by His grace and His grace alone. Listen, when you glorify God with the life worthy of the call, you are blessed beyond measure. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. Things are okay. It doesn't matter because you're in His plan, you're in His will, and you don't try to change that. Whenever you find yourself getting frustrated, angry, and bitter, it's because you're trying to do what only God can do. You are trying to play Jesus. You are trying to play God, trying to change things that cannot be changed in your power. The only thing that can be changed is through the Holy Spirit's power. So that's why when I pray for our nation, I pray that the Holy Spirit will get into the person that's in the White House and then they will start to do godly things through godly principles. Because the Spirit has to enter a body. Can I get an amen here? So that's why we pray that way. We pray that the Spirit of God enters the person in leadership so they can what? Do things God's way. Can I get a big amen here? Please. Understand that you can't change the world. Jesus changed the world by the principles of the Bible. So when you pray, the power is in the prayer. And through the Holy Spirit that can get inside anybody. That's why when you pray for somebody, you pray that the Holy Spirit finds them, gets inside them, and causes a transformation like when it changed you. That's the only way it's going to work. You ever try to tell somebody what they should do? You put up a wall. They don't want to hear it. Don't tell me what to do because you don't do it either. Do as I say, not as I do. So where to what? Pray. Pray, prayer is your most powerful weapon against your enemies. Can I get a big amen there? The fourth one. Grace is required to operate in God's vision for your life. Did you know that you were called a minister of the manifold grace of God? The Greek word translated as manifold in this context means diverse indicating the various forms and expressions of God's grace working through the believer. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 12. We're not going to read it, but I just want you to know, in 1 Corinthians 12, you can study the various grace gifts givers that God gives each believer. All right? It's in 1 Corinthians 12. For the sake of time, I can't go there. Recognize that your gifts are unique to you, helps you focus on your calling without comparing yourself to others. Do you compare yourself to other people? Oh, I'm doing better than them. I'm doing... Or do you compare yourself to the cross of Jesus Christ? And saying, I'm not doing better than anybody. We're all equal in God's eyes. Can I get an amen here? Please. There's no room for pride in our church. No room for pride here. All of us are in the same boat. And everything that each one of us has comes from God's grace and God's grace alone. The good Lord giveth and the good Lord taketh away. So please, always give God glory for the things, your abilities, your talent, your job, whatever it might be, your family. He gets the glory, not us. Listen now. Grace gifts are not given to you for selfish gain, okay? But to edify and build up the body of Christ. They equip you to serve others in love, share the gospel, and demonstrate the love and goodness of God. Like we have people that come in on Saturday. They sacrifice their time to glorify God. They do it because what? Out of love. Not because they have to, because they want to. Nobody forces anybody to come here. They come out of love for God. This is what I have. I don't have much, but this is what I can offer. Me. Whatever I can do to help the church. Whatever it is. I don't have a lot of money, but I have my time. And I'm going to give it to the Lord and to his house so people can well, be comfortable and have a nice church to come to. Can I get an amen here? 
All of us have gifts and abilities. Can help out in any way, shape, or form. To just sacrifice a little bit of their time to help make the church back to its former glory. We've been here for two plus years now, and we haven't stopped putting it back to where it was. And thank God, it's through God's grace and the people that willfully sacrifice their time because they love the Lord, they love God's house, and they love God's people. Listen, understanding and operating your spiritual gift allows you to fulfill God's vision for your life with humility and purpose. See, when you're not serving God, you're stuck in yourself, trying to find purpose out there within yourself. What can I do to make my life better? No, it's not about that when you become a Christian. When you become a Christian, is what can I do to make someone else's life better? That's the difference. That's the transformation. What can I do to make the church better? What can I do to portray Jesus better? What can I do with my life, with my time, to make life better for someone else? And that's when the fulfillment comes. You get fulfilled when you give. You never get fulfilled when you take. When you take, it's insatiable. More, more, more. I want this. Give me, give me, give me. But when you give is when you're truly satisfied. And you feel blessed. I know every time I preach, every time I come here, I, I am so blessed beyond measure. And I don't deserve any of it. But just for him choosing me to do this, I am blessed beyond red. I am the richest guy in the world. In here. Money can't put what God's put in my heart. You can't buy it. You can't build it. You can't get it. I was like, I get it from what? Serving him. And loving him. That's the only way it happens. Because I know what it's like to serve myself. It's insatiable. I can never get enough of me. <laughs> me, me, me. What about me? What about me? Everybody forgot about me. Right? But when it's about Jesus, you don't care if anybody sees it. Because you know the one you're serving sees it. God sees everything we do. Trust me. He sees it all. And let me tell you something. That's where the blessing comes into your heart. You see, when you truly serve God is when you get that inner peace, that promised land emotion where everything's going to be okay. I'm in God's will. I'm in God's plan. I'm doing what he chose me to do. I'm doing what I was born to do. Once you find your purpose is when fulfillment comes. And until that comes, till you find your purpose, you'll never ever experience the fulfillment that Jesus died to give you. Go with me to James 4. Ever since we got on this road, this journey, it has not been easy. It's been a journey. Sometimes really good, and sometimes like I want to hide underneath the pulpit. I don't feel like doing it. So many times I was in a pit of despair and depression. But still, I read Lamentations and I dare to hope that it's only for a season and if I go through it with the Lord, I'm going to be blessed and then I can help someone else get through it when they need it. Instead of what? Trying to go around it and cover it. Instead of going through it and saying, God's put me through that so I can help somebody else. You see, when you've got that kind of mind focus, then you know why you, you, what your purpose is. You understand why he's doing it. So you can go through it and get through it and help someone else. Look at James 4, verse 6. Give everybody a second to get there. There's one thing I've become that I never was before. Is patient. I definitely got patient with people in church because I had no choice. <laughs> I had no choice to be patient with difficult people, with people that are, you know, going through things to understand look, John, you're here, to, you've been through it, hang in there with them, empathize with them, knowing this is a hard journey, have patience with them. Now I'm learning to have patience on the road. When I'm driving, the biggest challenge of my life. 
I'm getting there though. <laughs> I still I still can't put the fish on my bumper yet. I can't put it on there yet. I'm getting there. <laughs> it's the funniest thing though. The more I try, the more God puts a roadblock in front of me. You know? You know, I'm going up Middle Spring Avenue. I've already been on Miserable Spring Avenue, right? Especially when it's busy. It's like two miles. It takes, it takes an hour to get from one end to the other. And it's only a mile. And it's like, okay. And usually, i got to get somewhere in a certain amount of time. And what happens? I get stuck beside somebody that's driving 15. They, they reduce the speed limit to 25. And somebody's driving 15. And then they finally turn. I say, well, thank you, Jesus. And then there's a cop in front of me. And he's only going 15. And then when he leaves, somebody stop, doesn't stop coming out of the street and just cuts right in front of me. And then they're going 15. So I just have to sit back and say, all right, Lord, I get it. Takes a few times, though. It's like, come on. You can't pass. What are you going to do? So I have to learn to accept it. Just like you have to learn to accept where God has you. See, when you try to squirm out where God has you, is when the problems come. Say, so, all right, Lord, you have me right where you want me. What am I going to do with this? Am I going to try to get out of it? Or am I going to hang in there, trust you, and learn the lesson you're trying to show me through it? Look what it says in verse 6, James 4. And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What's the formula? Get off your high horse, humble yourself, right? Resist the devil. There's, 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 there's these things that have to take place. Once the devil gets at you, right, you have to what? Humble yourself, say, Lord, I can't, I'm not stronger than the devil. The devil's a lot stronger than me. I cannot fight this force without you, right? It says, humble yourself, then resist. I'm not going to go there, and then he will flee from you. You see the formula? Do we use the formula that the Bible gives us when the devil is all up on us? Or do we fall prey to him and stop what? Spewing out what the devil wants us to say. Mm, and ruin our testimony instead of giving us what? The zipper. Lord, I'm not, I'm not, if I don't have anything good to say, I'm not going to say anything. Or if I am going to say something, something comes at me and you just say, God bless you. People are like, what? You'd be surprised with something good, how it could erase something bad. So you replace evil with good. So when somebody comes at you with evil, Hey, can I buy you a coffee? They're like, what are you talking about? Yeah, can you want a coffee? Yeah, then, then what? Then they're your friend again. You see, that's how easy it is. But we can't do that. Instead of we say, eh, and we go back at them with something, right? we got to defend ourselves and come back with something, something bad instead of something good. But when you do it God's way, it puts out the fire on both sides. Try it sometime. You might like it. You might like the result. The Bible works if you work it. The principles of the Bible work if you use the principles of the Bible. Rather than striving, listen to me, to fit into someone else's calling, you can embrace God's purpose for you. Secure in the knowledge that His grace is sufficient for you to fulfill His will for your life. I had no idea that I had the ability to do this. I want to sit in the back. God said, no, John, you don't have the ability to do it. I do. I'm going to put my ability in you so you can do it. And here I am because I trusted God. And he gives you all the abilities. Listen, don't ever feel that you can't serve the Lord because you can't in the flesh. But Jesus has your back. That's the first time I ever went up on the pulpit. You know what he said to me, a friend of mine? He said, John, look, don't worry. Jesus has your back. I, I wanted to fall into a hole before I got up here. It was the hardest trip to the pulpit the first time I ever went up here. But Jesus took over. And he empowers me to do this. It's a gift. And I love it. 
All I have to do is get out of the way and he uses me. All you have to do is get out of the way and he'll use you. The only one that's in the way is you from him using you. Now listen. Hope, listen, I hope you're starting to get a picture of God's wonderful grace. I hope you are. While his grace doesn't exempt you from difficulties, it does provide you with the comforting assurance that God is with you through every circumstance, equipping you with the resilience to persevere and overcome every trial in his strength. And I'm a living example of it. Right here. I'm a living example of that happening. My prayer for you is that God's grace is not just an abstract concept, but a transformative force that shapes your life and empowers you to fulfill God's calling for you. That's my prayer for you. As you meditate, listen, on the different facets of grace, receiving what you don't deserve, victory over sin, the personification of grace through Jesus, and operating in your unique spiritual gift, let it deepen your appreciation for God's unmerited favor that surrounds you like a shield. Go with me to Psalm chapter 5. Psalms chapter 5, look at verse 12. Psalm 5, verse 12. Look what it says. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surround them with your shield of love. How much more power do you want than God's shield of his love around you just for living for him? Do you realize the power of the universe is shielding you every day you go out there in the world? If you, if you choose to serve him, I am, listen, I'm as bold as a lion out there. You know why? Because I know that I'm protected because I'm doing what God wants me to do. Whenever I'm in his will, I'm as strong, as bold as a lion out there. I don't fear anything because I know God has me and I know his will is going gonna, is gonna to get me through. I know whatever he has me to do when I do it, he's going to do it through me. And I'm just going to trust him to do it because he's going to do for me what I could never do for myself. And he's going to do for you what you can never do for yourself. The problem is you have to step into the Jordan to let him do it. You have to trust him enough to go into the unknown world of service and see the power of God working through your life. So let's be thankful for God's mercy, but let's also embrace His grace, right, and step into the fullness of our divine destinies. As you grow in your understanding of God's grace, listen to me now, you may become a beacon of God's love and grace to a world so desperately in need of that right now. Extending the same grace to others that you have received from Him. Have you noticed whenever there's a tragedy, how people all come together, they put all their differences aside and go to the common cause of, of humanity who are loving each other? Why do you think God has to put calamity in the world? Because that's what drives us together. Other than that, when everybody's on there doing their own thing, nobody cares about anybody else. They're in their own little cave. But when tragedy strikes... And when problems come, it drives us all to our knees and into prayer again. Can I get an amen? And you understand that it's God's grace and God's grace alone bringing me there so I can get back in line and back in his will. Everything he does in your life is designed to make you Christ-like. And everything the devil's in your life to do is to make you an antichrist. And to depend on your own power to get through life. See, that's not the Christian way. The Christian way is what? Getting out of the way and letting God do the work in us. And not trying to do it ourselves. Because here's the thing. Trying to be a Christian in the flesh is a miserable job. You see, my job is to kill your flesh and let you walk in the spirit. Because in the spirit, we love Jesus. In the flesh, we're getting deprived. 
I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't enjoy this, I can't enjoy that. Listen, in the Spirit, you don't need any of that. You don't need to go here, go there, do all these things, build this, build that. You don't need to do it because you're in the Spirit saying, listen, this isn't my permanent home anyway. I'm just passing through. My next life is going to be really important. My new resurrected glorified body. See, if you believe that, you'll live out your destiny now for Him, knowing that there's a better life to come. But if you think that all there is is in this life, you're going to build your kingdom down here. That's the difference. I know for a fact, the Bible tells me that we're just passing through and we're just foreigners in this land. And let me tell you something, this world is getting foreign to me now. I, could, I, I have no interest in it anymore. I asked my wife if she wants to do something. She says, I don't want to go there. I don't want to do it. I want to sit down and relax. It's beautiful. Just imagine just being able to sit, relax, and do absolutely nothing and be comfortable there. How many of us sit there and say, oh, i got to do something. I feel like I'm not productive. I, I can't just sit around and do nothing. Why? Why can't you sit at the feet of Jesus and just enjoy it? Why does it always have to be performing and doing something? Can I get an amen here? When you start to learn that your contentment comes from depending on God and not yourself, you can get free of yourself. How about a big amen there? All right, we're going to close there. Thank you for letting me share that. I'm going to call the ushers up to take up the collection, and we're going to go. All right, Brittany's going to come up and sing. We're going to stand, and we are going to close.
beautiful song that is, ain't it? Hey, Drew, you want to come up and close us? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this message we heard this morning, Lord. We're just so grateful for your grace and mercy with us, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that we stay in your word, Lord. That's where you continue to encourage us and comfort us, Lord. And, Lord, we'll never be confused if we keep you first, Lord. And thank you for always comforting us and giving us the strength we need to keep going every day, Lord. Let us be patient with ourselves and others, Lord. And, Lord, continue to use us as your vessels, Lord, to to show Jesus out there, Lord. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, Drew. Thanks, Drew. All right, everybody. The service is over. Have a great day. Until we meet again, God bless. Peace.